Gospel of John, chapter 12. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> How many of you feel like you know the scripture? I'm going to go to the verse. Some of you, you'd be wrong. <laughs> Normally, I would go to verse 24 for sure, but we're going to uh, go to verse 32. <clears throat> John 12, 32. <clears throat> and for Scott and Kelly and all of the people who write this stuff down, the title for this will be The Foolishness of the Cross as a Means of Drawing. Pardon? Sure. So you're wondering what the words are after the, right, Scott? The foolishness of the cross as a means of drawing. <clears throat> and we're going to be in verse 32. So if you'll look there with me. This is Jesus speaking, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. <clears throat> All right, when he's talking about being lifted up here, of course, he's not talking about being lifted up in a praise and worship service. Uh, he's not talking about lifting him up uh, in preaching or in sharing the word. <clears throat> a lot of times when we think about lifting up the Lord, those are the most common things. Well, we're going to go lift, you know, where are you going? A bunch of young people going out from the church, where are you going? We're going to go lift up Jesus. <clears throat> but this is a reference to his death, uh, to the cross. And verse 33 proves that, the next verse right after it. This he said, signifying what death he should die. <clears throat> Not just that he was going to die, but what manner of death being lifted up on a cross and <clears throat> of course we know that at this stage this is before he has died on the cross this is before the events of the cross has taken place and people are still speculating as to who he is is he the messiah is he a prophet you know who is this guy and of course <clears throat> we know that for Israel, he was the promised Messiah. He was, and, and you know, you sort of have to have a Jewish mindset here because they weren't looking for a savior in the same terms that we were. They were looking for a Jewish king, a chosen one that God had planned and that he was going to come to the earth and he was going to set up a kingdom on the earth and they were going to be part of this kingdom and they were going to be happy and healthy and wealthy and wise as most of you are. <clears throat> um, so, you know, Jesus' words <clears throat> many times would throw them off because they're looking for the Messiah. And you know the word Christ is, is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah. <clears throat> and so Jesus is speaking here and he's signifying Number one, that he should die. And number two, that he's going to die on a cross. And this is throwing them because they're going, well, that can't be, our, that can't be the, the Messiah. And, uh, <clears throat> but they, the thing is, is that they understood from, if you look at verse 34, they understood that he was talking about his death. Uh, this, let's see, verse 34, the people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Messiah or Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou the son of man must be lifted up. Who is this son of man? So they're saying he's going to, he's supposed to abide forever. What, what do you, you know, if you're the Messiah, you know, then why are you saying he's going to be lifted up on a cross? And then they go, well, you must not be talking about yourself. Who is this person you're talking about? Who is this <clears throat> son of man that you're throwing in there? Why not just say the Messiah or whatever? And of course, as you know, Jesus didn't really say that a whole lot. There wasn't a lot of situations where he would tell them those things. 
<clears throat> and so um, uh, they, the one thing that they didn't understand, even if they sort of understood that he was talking about death, <clears throat> the one thing that they didn't grasp in its fullness is that this Messiah had come to be crucified on a cross. And, you know, they might be able to accept him, you know, everything from being killed from an angry mob to <clears throat> dying of old age, you know, or something, I don't know. But, they, but uh, some, some form of death. But they didn't fully comprehend what he was saying, or they would have said, wait a minute. You know, wait a minute. <clears throat> and um, uh, probably had they understood, they would have really, really rebelled against that. And so I wrote a statement here I wanted to read to you. Nothing seemed more unlikely to human reason than that such a death as crucifixion should attract, attract men unto him. Because the real theme that I want to share on today, and <clears throat> the, one of the the major points that he was making here is that if I be lifted up, there's going to be a drawing to me. And I, I, I sense that maybe the light just went on for some of you. That one particularly. <laughs> and there's nobody in that area right there except for, you know, <laughs> Patty's going, I see it. <laughs> so, Jesus, you know, and especially the disciples, but any of them, <clears throat> Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's talking about, you know, if I be lifted up, I'm going to draw men. This is what I'm going to use, this cross, this death, this, this crucifixion of myself, that's how I'm going to draw people. <clears throat> Again, the statement, nothing seemed more unlikely to human reason than that such a death as crucifixion should attract men <clears throat> unto him. Okay, well, folks, that's not only true of back then, that's true today, that people would go, how in the world would preaching Christ crucified attract anybody? Why would anybody want that kind of Messiah? Why would anybody want that kind of a Savior? <clears throat> and going through all, you know, uh, uh, the things that, that people go through, because, I mean, you know, <laughs> Who would ever believe that, you know, you could draw men out of weakness? I mean, we want to draw men out of strength. We want to draw men out of power. Did I say that right? Power. <clears throat> but Jesus said, my method for drawing them is going to be out of weakness and out of his own crucifixion. And so... Um, if you'll turn with me to Matthew, we'll see a, a little more of this. Matthew 16. <clears throat> verse 21. <clears throat> Matthew 16:21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and to be raised again the third day. Okay, so <clears throat> here Jesus is spelling out this thing of his plan as Messiah. Hit, you know, have you ever had, you know, some of you who have been in the ministry, you've had people talk to you and say, you know, what, what's going on with your ministry? Da, 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 da. Now, what's your five-year plan? You know, what's your five-year plan? I don't know what the Lord's going to do tomorrow, you know. <clears throat> and if I told you my five-year plan, I don't plan on using it, you know. <clears throat> you know what I mean? If I had one, uh, that, would, that would hurt my brain, um, you know. <clears throat> it is, it is. Well, so, but, but Jesus' five-year plan is only like a very short plan. He's going to go to the cross, and he's going to die. And not only, he, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't say, I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to die for your sin. He says the, that uh, 
uh, that he must go to Jerusalem and he is going to suffer many things and it's going to be at the hands of the religious the people, the people, the respected, knowledgeable people and uh, <clears throat> and I'm going to and then he said I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be killed. Well, Peter didn't like that too much. Peter was like, wait a minute. Hold it. I believe, remember, because this was just before this is when Jesus turned to, you know, them and said, who do, who do people say you are? And they said, well, some think you're John the Baptist. Some think you're the prophet Elijah. Some people think this and that. Jesus says, who do you think I am? And, and uh, he says, you are the Messiah or Christ, the son of the living God. And so the Messiah says back to him, okay, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and everybody that has respect and honor and power and authority, they're going to turn against me and kill me. And Peter's kind of going, you know, well, you, you know, you can, you can read the words there, verse 22. Then Peter took him. That's kind of, you ever notice that? He didn't. He didn't, you know, he probably grabbed him by both shoulders <laughs> and took him. Uh, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, thou shalt, uh, this shall not be unto thee. All right. <clears throat> if you're following Jesus, and this is a new movement, and you're on the front end of this thing, and Jesus is talking about ending it, really soon in a bad way <clears throat> or he's talking because really you know what he didn't in that in John there he didn't just say we're going to end this thing he said we're going to draw men we're going to draw men I'm going to go die and they're going to kill me and we're going to draw men Peter's going hold it hold it look I think we could come up with a better way to draw men and get people interested in what we're about, you know. <clears throat> and so he takes him and rebukes him. And uh, verse 23, and he turned and he said unto him, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that are of God. Now remember what he's talking about. I mean, you know. We can use that, we can just pull that verse out anytime we want to and say, you don't savor the things that be of God, you know, because you don't show up to church on time. I don't know who I'm talking about. You show up on church on time because you're with me and I'm going to be. <clears throat> But he's, he's not talking about the things that we would talk about, the things that we would condemn people for so that we could uh, have more people or more money or more whatever in the church. He's talking about his plan, and his plan is a crucified Messiah. That's, that's, the plan. that's what Paul called it, didn't he? He says, you know, I'm determined not to know anything among you but Messiah crucified. I preached Messiah crucified. I mean, does that sound a little different to your ears, especially if you're thinking as a Jew? You're going, Paul, what is wrong with you? Jesus, what is wrong with you? People, people, what is wrong with you? <clears throat> you're emphasizing the wrong thing. And then the next verse, um, verse 24, now remember this is following right on the heels of this. Then said Jesus unto his disciple, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall save it. <clears throat> so Jesus is not only rebuking Peter for his wrong view of the way Jesus wants to draw people. But he's also assuring him and everybody that's there with him that if you're going to follow him, it's going to involve a cross. It, that, 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 that this is what we do. 
<laughs> you know, and Jesus could be saying, look, don't you get it? This is what we do. And he's talking about followers. If you're going to come after me, if you're going to follow me, then we're going to, you know, you remember the scripture where Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. You know, you'll draw men. You know, because, I mean, if you use a net, you throw it out there and you draw unto you, right? Or if you just used a rod and reel, you get it and catch and you draw it unto you. The whole process is drawing people. <clears throat> well, I don't think Peter understood when he said that initially that this, you know, that you're going to, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I don't think he got it. I don't think he was thinking, what, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to preach a Messiah crucified and we're going to also take up a cross and this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to draw people. <clears throat> but that's exactly what Jesus said. So, Turn uh, back to John with me, John 18, <clears throat> and we'll see some of the reasons why in the external, why this appeared to be such a bad idea. <clears throat> some of you are thinking, I already know why it's a bad idea. <clears throat> John 18, <clears throat> excuse me. In John 18, this is uh, Jesus being before Pilate. And uh, verse, um, verse 29 and 30. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a mal malefactor, meaning an evildoer, <coughs> we would not have delivered him up to thee. In other words, to be crucified, to be um, brought before a judge and have all the people turn against you, and then they're yelling crucify him, to have that take place means to everybody that you are an evildoer. That's, that's part of it. <clears throat> uh, most of you know Galatians. We'll turn there, though. Galatians 3, where he also gives us a little bit different angle of this. Galatians 3.13. <clears throat> Um, Galatians 3.13. <clears throat> Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. All right, so uh, to, uh, to hang on a tree, to hang on the cross is evidence of God's curse on your life. Do you get that? That's what this is saying. To be crucified, to hang on a cross, to hang on a tree, that's, he's using the cross as an example of a tree and using that scripture and he's saying, this is proof of the curse of God. God has cursed you. Well, we know, we understand. We understand that the curse of God was, you know, the him joining to the old creation and us and sin and everything else and taking it to the cross and putting it to death. But the Jews didn't initially understand that. And when they saw him hanging on that tree or when they saw him being prepared to be hung on that tree, they not only said he's an evildoer like these other two guys over here that are hung on either side of him. He is cursed of God. Okay. Now, <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, it's one thing to have all the leaders and everything turn against you. It's another thing to, to, to be put to death in a manner that people will assume you're cursed of God, and it is another thing to say, this is how we're going to draw men. Okay. You, you following that? I mean, it's all of those are, that's one thing. This is another thing. <clears throat> but when it's all said and did, done, you're a malefactor. No, you're worse than that. You are cursed of God. If I be lifted up from the earth, this is the manner that I'm going to draw all men unto me, okay? <clears throat> and Paul's not talking about the curse just dying on wood. 
He's talking about the, the, the uh, uh, stigma and the shame of, of being crucified on the cross. <clears throat> All right, another statement I made. This is based on man's wisdom, totally based on man's wisdom. According to man's wisdom, to lift up from the earth by crucifixion would not attract men, but would be the most sure way to repel them. Shall I say it again? To, according to man's wisdom, according to Peter who was rebelling against that, according to that wisdom to lift somebody up from the earth by crucifixion would not attract men, but would be the most sure way to chase them off. Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, we've seen this one well, within the last year anyway. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's read verse 23 through 25. But we preach a crucified Messiah. We preach Messiah crucified. We preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Gentiles foolishness. But under them who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God, meaning the cross, is wiser than men, and the weakness of God, meaning the cross, is stronger than men. <clears throat> All right, so however unreasonable or unlikely that uh, in, the, you know, in the minds of his followers or the people that are listening to him, no matter how foreign or crazy or, you know, that that might seem to be using that method God said, this is my chosen method. This is how I draw men. Now, one thing you have to remember. You have to remember that he didn't say, if I be lifted up from the earth, based, you know, on the cross, that I will draw all men to you, or to your ministry, or to your church, or to my church, or my ministry. Or my... He didn't say this method would draw people to you. He said, but those that are drawn will be drawn to him. That's a, that's a huge point. It's a huge point. Because many people who read that scripture in John, that if I be lifted up, I'll draw men to, to me, assume that that's the, you know, okay, well, then he's going to draw it. And, and if we do that, you know, then it's going to make our church bigger or it's going to make you know, my ministry more famous or it's going to do this or that and people are really going to be... <clears throat> no. As a matter of fact, it's not just drawing them, th that cross, it's not going to just draw them to Jesus of Nazareth. It's going to draw them to Messiah crucified. Now, that may not be everybody. In fact, not everybody's going to be saved, Right? But all men that are going to really be drawn unto him, they're going to be drawn to Christ crucified. And that's what those scriptures are saying. That's, that's the goal. Not just to, you know, have a popular ministry and have people drawn and, you know, have all this stuff and, <clears throat> and yet not getting people to Jesus, but making your own disciples and, and doing your own thing and, and turning things to fit your situation a little more than Jesus is. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So, but the amazing thing about that and the amazing thing about <clears throat> these scriptures that we just read is that the foolishness of God will soon, very soon after his words that he's spoken here, will be soon found to be wiser than men. And the weakness of Jesus on that cross will soon be found, very soon be found to be stronger than all the strength of man. Um, 
Let's see. You know, I really got a lot of scriptures here, so I'll, I'll just tell you. In, in uh, <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, you're familiar with it. You don't have to turn there. But that's on the day of Pentecost, seven weeks later after Jesus said these things, and after seven weeks, seven weeks later, <clears throat> you know, just but prior to these certain things here, the disciples are all hid in the upper room, and they're scared, and they're they're thinking this. If they kill Jesus, they're going to kill us. So we need to lock ourselves in here. We need to be afraid of this cross stuff. When Jesus was hung on the cross, most of them, all of them, but John went and hid themselves and ran in fear and terror to protect themselves. But all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes, and the result of the coming of the Holy Spirit is what? Well, most people say, <clears throat> speaking in tongues and, and all that stuff, and, you know, I don't have a problem with that. If, you know, if you feel free to do anything that is in the Word of God. <clears throat> if it's in the Word, then it's valid. However, the result of the coming of the Holy Spirit was a whole new apprehension of Christ crucified. Okay? And so all of a sudden, three thousand people are being drawn to Messiah crucified. An incredible thing that you would even think about just seven weeks early. No, man, we can't preach this. We can't emphasize that. We can't, you know, go that way and follow him in this way. And yet here it is. It's already started. God's moving on it. God's touching lives. Who? We don't know. It's up to him. It's to those that are prepared. Maybe, maybe some of these 3,000 were in the crowd yelling, crucify him. But now the Spirit of God's moving and beginning to, to change these things. And, <clears throat> and so, you know, you keep going here. Uh, again, I've got a whole bunch of scriptures here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm afraid, I don't know how much time it'll take to get through all my scriptures, so I'll just mention the, the verse here is Acts 6, 7, and it says, this is, this is now shortly after the 3,000, the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great number of the priests were obedient to the faith. I thought that was interesting. A great number of the priests, it didn't say of the Sadducees or the Pharisees, it said a great number of those who regularly kill animals as sacrifice for their sins and had spent centuries and generations of their family being in the priesthood, the tribe of Levi, and seeing this thing and all of a sudden they're realizing that Messiah crucified is the fulfillment of this thing. This is it, a great number of priests. And they are falling down before the crucified and saying, you're our Messiah. Well, how is crazy is that for the priest to do that? How did they get drawn? How did they get drawn? They got drawn by lifting up Christ crucified. That's how they got drawn. That's how they got drawn. And then later on in, in uh, chapter <clears throat> Acts 14 and also chapter 19, um, you, have, you have the Lord dealing with those sharp-minded Greeks. You know, they had all the great philosophies. You know what I mean? And, and got it all figured out, and they have a philosophy for everything. And all of a sudden, as I said, in those, in those two chapters, you see all these Greeks start com coming to the Lord. And they're starting, to go, they're starting to lay down all their philosophies and pick up Messiah crucified. They're starting to say, this is, this is the answer. How in the world do you get through, a, get through to a mind like that that has it all figured out? You don't. But you still lift up Messiah crucified. You still lift up Christ crucified. And that's how it starts getting through. Is there human wisdom to that? No. Is there God's wisdom to that? Yeah. You know, and I'm not putting down human wisdom per se as much as I'm saying 
1 Corinthians 20, 1, 23 through 25 was saying that this crucified wisdom is foolishness to them. So, but then he says, but the wisdom of God, the weakness of God, this crucified one is wiser. It's wiser than all men. It is the wisdom of God. <clears throat> and then, of course, <coughs> I don't know why I'm having so much trouble with my throat, but I'm back in Texas. Ah, Philippians chapter 3. And so you see that, um, <clears throat> that just like the Greeks who, you know, had all these philosophies and things that <clears throat> they're being attracted to a greater reality and that's the crucified one. That's lifting Jesus up on that cross. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> then also you see Paul here in verse 10, Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. <clears throat> Paul was basically a, a Hellenist, meaning that he leaned toward a Greek view of the Hebrew scriptures. <coughs> And he was, you know, he was wise compared to many others, it says in Galatians, the first chapter. And so he's persecuting. He's, he is, for example, Stephen, he is seeing to it that Stephen is put to death. And it says over in Acts also that he is making Christians. He's taking them and putting them in prison and making them blaspheme against Jesus. That's the wisdom of this world. That's wrong. That can't be right. Messiah crucified. Our Messiah and crucified. He's going to save us. He's going to do everything we want. He's going to, you know, he's going to fix everything. He's going to make our lives wonderful. He's not going to make our lives dead. Paul's praying <clears throat> to be made conformable to his death. And <clears throat> even after a while, Soon those Romans, those mighty Romans who were the ones who were the instrument to crucify Jesus, soon even they began to bow the knee before the crucified one. So much so that, you know, they, they're, going, <clears throat> they're going to fight against their enemies and they're lifting up a banner of the very one that they crucified in weakness and in shame. the very one that they were happy to crucify him and mock him. Now they're bowing their knee and looking up to him and saying, you are the power of this earth. You, and they're going with that banner of the cross. <laughs> That's crazy. <clears throat> All right. So in Philippians 10 then, there is a 310. That crucifixion and the wisdom behind it is <clears throat> it's not being confined to uh, just the original 12. It is already spreading out. And you see that all through the book of Acts. And then you see Paul, even in the book of Acts, you see him carrying it forth. And, and they're counting all things lost. And, they're, they're desire, and, and that's just up above here and just a few scriptures above it, verse 8 and <clears throat> 7 and 8. Um, Yea, doubtless, I count all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now remember that he calls, he calls this crucified way the wisdom of God. Now, now who's on that cross? Tell me, who was on that first cross there in the middle? Jesus. Okay. He's Jesus of Nazareth. He's Messiah. He's the Christ. He's also, what else? The Son of God. 
Okay, he's the son of God. Okay. Just throw a quick thing at you. <clears throat> God crucified. The wisdom of God. See, the Romans would say inventing this cross was our wisdom. And it was as far as their cruelty and their intention to beat the masses to a pulp so that they would serve them and bow to them and love them. But instead of Jesus inventing a cross to crucify everybody else on in that sense, he goes to the cross. And it's called the wisdom of God, and that's the Son of God hanging right there on that cross. He was God, and, and in the, being in the form of God, he thought it not a thing to be grasped after, to still hold on to every ounce of that. And he became incarnated or became as a man and then became as a servant in a man form, which is getting even lower than just a man. He could have been a man and been higher. Then he served, and he's washing the disciples' feet just the night before he's crucified. Serving them. And <clears throat> Paul sees this thing. He sees the spirit of this thing. And he sees, the, he sees the, the power of this thing to transform someone out of selfishness and self-centeredness and... Um, uh, I mean, when I say self-centeredness, we go, well, you know, that's because you, you reached up and you grabbed the last piece of pie before anybody else had a chance to get it. That's so self No! Self-centric. Yeah. Uh, you know, you walk in a circle of, of self-centricness. I know that's probably not the best way to say it, but most of you know what I'm trying to express, and that is that you're in the center of this life that you live. And it may not be evil. It's just centered on you. Well, what about me? You know, you know. Well, what about Jesus? <clears throat> well, so this thing starts spreading, man, and I mean, it starts taking off, and there's no explanation for it. I mean, seven weeks later, and you've got, th uh, you know, thousands coming and going. You know what? We believe in Messiah crucified, and the disciples are sitting there. Peter's the one preaching, and that they came to the to him, to the Lord, not to Peter. They came based on his preaching of the cross. But he's remembering. I remember when Jesus said, "If I be lifted up, I'll draw," and I said, "That's stupid, Jesus. No, not so. Remember, not so, Lord, not so, Lord." You don't say, Lord, not so in the same breath. But there it is. There it is. Not so, Lord. Well, who's the Lord then? If you can correct the Lord, then you're the Lord. Well, only for a sentence, because the next sentence is, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> because you savor in your mind the wisdom and understanding of this world that seeks to save itself and is not willing to give up that others may gain. So now they're in. The disciples are in now, and they're, 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 they're coming out of the shell. They're coming out of the, you know, it's like, okay, you know, okay, we preach Christ crucified, but I guess we're going to have to do it in the confines of this locked upper room. And there's, there's no help for us here. But thank God we got the doors locked so that all those people that hate this preaching won't come get us. And so Jesus just goes right through the wall and goes, Hi, guys. Peace. Holy moly. <laughs> you know, look at this. So then they go, I guess we're going to take this out to the streets, you know. So they open the doors and they unlock the locks and they say, You know what? It's time to quit being ashamed of this. This one lives in us now. This is our life. I mean, you know. And so they start, and then, here it starts. Here it starts. And it goes, and it goes, and it goes. And 
And it goes right up to this, this day, preaching the cross, preaching Christ, preaching, preaching the crucified Messiah. It goes up to this day, and it still draws. And just, just this recent conference that we, we had over in Ireland, I mean, there were Belgians there, and there's Iranians, and British, and Irish, and Americans, and they're all gathered together, and they're there for one reason. They're there not just for Jesus, but for Christ crucified. And they're coming, and they're sp spending their own money, and they're coming across Europe, and they're gathering together, and just like our conference, when we have people coming, and trust me, there's, we're going to have more foreigners in November, <clears throat> because they want to be here and uh, it's their heart and, and, and they want the Lord. It's not this place. I mean, come on, you know. I mean, there are most, most, most people in Denton don't even know we exist and the ones they do think something other than what, you know. They believe what was advertised, not what was kept quiet in the heart of the Lord, hopefully. But, that, but my point is, you know, with all these, these people that were there in Ireland, the cross still draws today. Christ crucified does. He's still drawing people. It's happening. And you know what? We're not the only ones involved in this. There are people all over the world we don't even know about preach Christ crucified. We're nothing special. We're just a tiny, tiny little cog in a big thing that God's doing. But you can be assured, based on all these scriptures we're talking about, that there's that crucified Messiah is still drawing people to him, not, not just to religion. You know, folks, there'll probably come a day when religion will be seen for what it is, and it'll just crumble, you know. <clears throat> and I'm not happy about that, I, I, you know. But the scripture there isn't talking about being drawn to those things that most want people drawn to. You know, I mean, I've been in the ministry for a lot of years, and I know a lot of pastors, and I'm sorry. There are some that they want more warm bodies in their pews or in their chairs because that means more tithe money, and it means their salary can be bigger. And they can brag to their friends, you know. <clears throat> and... That's not true of all of them, but that is true of some of them, okay? Well, Jesus didn't say, you know, and, uh, well, here's what they would say. Well, I can't preach that, and I've, I've been told that. I can't preach that. I've been told that. Well, if I preach that, I'll lose my church. I, I, did I hear somebody say what kind of church is it? Yeah. I didn't say that, folks. If you're listening to Skype, I, <laughs> but I mean, you know, the church is the body of Christ, the vehicle of his life. The church, the body of Christ. I will probably get to that scripture, but that's, you know, I said we'll probably get to that scripture and look up and Kelly's holding up his sign and with how much minutes I got left. And we may not. <clears throat> All right. So, anyway, my, my point about uh, the, the recent conference that we had in Ireland is. There are still people being added to the fold of Christ crucified. They're, st they're still being added, and they're hungry, and they're, and, you know, I can even say it this, and loving it. <laughs> Not afraid of it or ashamed of it. Sorry for using Maxwell Smart there for the, some of you who, are, <clears throat> you know, but... You know, they're, they're not ashamed. They're, they're, they're going. They're going for the Lord, and they, they want him. And, um, uh, and, and the thing is, is that they're going after the same one, the same cross that Jesus took. You, you understand what I'm saying? The same cross and the same spirit and the same thing. Look with me over into 1 John chapter 3. And we want to talk just a little bit about, you know, what is the attraction? 1 John chapter 3. I mean, because if this is happening, where, you know, wherein is the power of the cross? Where is that? What is, what's the thing that's doing the attracting there? What's the secret of this attraction? And, um, and how is it that such strength, 
can be brought out of apparent weakness. It's just amazing. I mean, it's amazing. And we find it here. <clears throat> 1 John 3.16 By this perceive we the love of God. By this perceive we what? The power of God? The, no, well, here he's communicating the love of God. Not just that he died, but because he, he laid down his life for us. All right. I, I want to take time to develop that, but I'm not going to have time. But that it's not just by this perceive we salvation because he died for us. Listen carefully to that scripture. By this we perceive love because he gave himself for us. Selflessness, love. Love is selflessness. True love is selflessness. Human love will do that for those that he loves. But, you know, well, I mean, what is it? Um, Gospel of John chapter 15, verse 13 says, For, a, you know, uh, <coughs> greater love hath no man. But he's talking about man's love. Greater love hath no man than this. He would lay down his life for his friends. But Romans 5, verse 10, right along in there, says, but God's love, here is the love of God, that he gave himself for the ungodly, for his enemies, and gladly took upon their blame, their sin. Do you see the difference? You know, I mean, one is, I'll die for my friend. The other one is, I'll die for my enemy. Hello. Hello. Still glad I'm back? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so, but why do, we, why do we do this? Well, the scripture says we love him because he first loved us. He loved us with an unselfish love, and we love him on that same basis because he put that same spirit in us, his same nature within us. <clears throat> And, of course, Galatians 2.20, we're familiar with the first part. You know, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, Christ, live within me. But then he says, and the life I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. I live by faith in love that gives itself for me. Who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by faith in love that gives itself for me. And remember now. In that verse, that in part, he's saying that gave that I live by the faith of the Son of Man who loved me and gave himself for me. But the full sentence is, I'm practicing that same thing. I'm crucified with Christ. And I don't, I give myself so that he lived, just as he gave, you know. I mean, we always go, Jesus gave himself so I could live, you know. We go, now I'm going to just live. But then Paul sees the love of God on the cross, and he goes, you know what? I'm going to give myself so he can live Amen. in me. Because he perceives that love. I'm per I perceive it. I don't just take advantage of it. You know, it's like, well, I'm saved, so I'll live my life, and, and I'll try to get the Messiah to bless me with everything he can. You know? Instead of blessing him with everything that you can. <clears throat> um, Ephesians chapter 5 also. Here's, here's, how you, here's what defines a follower. Ephesians 5. Verse 1. This is basically Paul's definition of a follower of God and what they're like. Verse 1 and 2. Be ye followers of God as dear children and walk in love. Okay. So being a follower of God as defined by Paul is that we walk in love. But that's not what I call, you know, ooey gooey love or, or sloppy agape. But selfless giving. Let's read it on. Let's keep reading Walk in love as Christ hath loved us. Well, how did Christ love it? Where are you going to find the love of God? At the cross, always and forever. Love others as Christ hath loved us. 
And just in case we don't get it, he spells it out, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling offering. What is so sweet about that? That he gave up everything. He gave up, you know, as it were, he emptied himself of his godly rights and everything, became incarnated, came down here, gave up all of that, then literally let them crucify him for us. Hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice, which that kind of self-giving is a sweet savor to God. That's the love. And then, since we're close, Colossians chapter 1. And <clears throat> verse 18. Speaking of Jesus, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. The firstborn from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead. <laughs> he's the first, but he's the head of the body. The body follows the head. The body is, is the head, if you understand. It's not the head, but it is connected, therefore they are one. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning? He's just the beginning of something. He's the first born from the dead. That in all things he might have the preeminence. And it says that because he is the life in each and every member that does his spirit and his nature, not his bidding. It does his spirit and nature that yields to the life of Christ. <clears throat> so what did he come for? He came to establish a body. He came to, for a bride, not just, not just a mere religious system, not just a, you know, to, to you know, gather on uh, church services and Sundays and do stuff. But <clears throat> he said, I'm come that they might have life. But he is that life. You know, in fact, just a few verses down, verse 27, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. The, he's come for a body. He's come for a bride in whom he can dwell and do what? what you know, like sit in there and become our counselor. Like we look, at, look to our chest and go, hey, uh, should I go to Walmart now or should I, you know, stay home? He could have stayed in heaven for that. He's, he's got pretty good hearing. You know. he, could have gone, he could have heard it from way far off and gone, Walmart. <clears throat> but he's, you know, frankly, on a certain sense, he doesn't care, care if you go to Walmart or, or Target. Target. <clears throat> he doesn't care which one you go to. As long as when you go there, you carry him, and when, when somebody breaks in line in front of you, you bless them instead of cursing them. Just the thought. Still glad I'm back? <clears throat> all right. So, <laughs> but I mean, you know, we think it's all about correct doctrine and conforming, you know, ourselves to, to the, the demands of religion and all this kind of stuff, and he's life, you know. He's life. He's not the lesson. He's the life of the lesson. I mean, really, come think about it. We're, we're trying to get the lesson. Let's get the life of it. And that'll, that'll carry us through. All right, let me, let me make another one of my quotes here. Who is this Jesus we follow? He's the one who had all strength, but let his own creation slaughter him because of a belief that this kind of a way was the best, and it exhibited the highest wisdom possible because it was the wisdom of God. All right, so the message is, is a stumbling block to some people, isn't it? It's a stumbling block. My question to you is, is the preaching of Christ crucified a stumbling block to you? That's, actually, that's not my only question. <laughs> 
I have a lot of questions. I don't know why I have so many questions, but you know, so what is your individual pos position as regarding the cross? Is it just a place to get blessings or to conform to the image of the sun? You know, and, and trust me, I can believe that you don't want to, you know, you look at Jesus. Anybody ever been in a Catholic church and seen a crucifix with Jesus hanging on it? You know, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, we went in there and I went, you know, I'd heard about the cross, but they really, you know, <laughs> they, they gore it up, you know what I mean? He had this heart busting out of him, too. You know, it's like, you know. And, uh, and then in the, you know, and I wasn't even born again, though, you know. I mean, and then Methodist Church sings a lot of the same hymns. That, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. I'm going, you know, I'm only like 10, 11. I'm going, there's a, I'm picturing this pool of blood flowing over me or somebody's, I don't like needles anyway, you know, so it's like, <clears throat> but it's, so I can understand how people would go, would, would not understand, but it's, it's not the physical cross first and foremost we're talking about. We're talking about the selflessness of Christ in these things. All right, and just, uh, let's turn to 1 Timothy 1.17. I know I'm getting very close to hacking off the recording people. <clears throat> <laughs> Because I'm, I'm pushing the envelope. I'm, I'm pushing the boundaries of everything. <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> okay, verse 17. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, isn't that a great scripture? It is a great scripture. Only thing we need to notice is he's basically saying all that because he's the only wise God. Do you understand the wisdom that he's extolling here? It's the wisdom of Christ. He said the, the wisdom of God and the weakness of God is foolishness. He's talking about the cross here. He's talking about the, the one who is the king, eternal folks, is the one who was raised. He's the raised from the dead one. You know, in other words, it's the self-giving one that is raised and honored. Well, it is. You know, I don't have time to explain. We've probably got one minute left. But I don't have time to explain. But I can tell you right now, Jesus, you know, in, in eternity past, he's the son of God. He's king. He rules. All the angels bow to him. Everybody extols him, all of this stuff. He's not, they, they didn't go, he's back. You know, after the resurrection, you know, the guy that was king, we all worshiped and everything. He's back. He's, he's in another form. He's got a different body, us. He's, he's, he's become one with us, and we've become one with him. And there's a whole new reality of self-giving wrapped up into this. It's not the same thing. He didn't just, I'm this, I'm, you know, it's like Jesus before he comes down and becomes incarnated and turns to the Father and goes, look, uh, you know, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to do this thing for, you know, about 33 years, but I'll be back, you know. Right. You know, I'll be back. Don't worry. And, uh, and that's the way most people see the resurrection. He's back. No, 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 he's not. There was a death. And there's a resurrection of something greater than what went into death. That's us joined with him, but not just all the benefits that we get of that, but we're partakers of the divine nature, the self-giving one, the wisdom of God, you know, to him, the only wise God, you know what I mean? We're not just saying, you're smart. We're saying this wisdom, we're here because of that, and we're here to extol that because we have lived according to that. And all nations and kings or, or, or lands and races all gathered before the Lamb of God. You know, I just thought of something. I, I could go for another hour. Maybe we should do that. 
No, no, but the, the deal is, is I definitely need to let this run past 12 because it would ruin my reputation if we actually got out before 12. Is that really past? Yeah, I think it is. <clears throat> All right. To the only wise God, be glory and honor forever and ever and we honor that spirit, that nature, that selfless giving. And when we worship him during the worship service to the only wise God, I mean, it, remember, I mean, I know that you probably, you know, visualize Jesus sometimes when you're worshiping. And I know that some of you, at least at some time in your walk, have visualized this guy with a white robe and sandals and long hair and a beard, and, and he just looks so sweet. You know, it's like, oh, I just love you, Jesus, you know. Uh, that's a lamb, a slaughtered, by the way, it's a slaughtered lamb. That's the, that's the original, actual Greek, not just slain, slaughtered lamb that's on that throne. Not just some, something that appeals. There is no beauty that we should desire him, the scriptures say. There's only the beauty of his nature yes. that we would desire in us. <laughs> and we look at him, lamb, and we say, you are the most beautiful thing. Of the, and you are so wise. To, you know, lamb, you are lamb wise. How many of you are lamb wise? Yeah. All right. We'll stop. We're after 12 now. Let's bow our heads. Father, we just thank you for your graciousness toward us, your long suffering, and your desire for us to see you as you are and not as we have perceived you or as others have painted a picture of you, to extol you for the right reasons. To truly give honor because we're honoring what should have been honored, what you honored, Father, when, when it says, wherefore, you highly exalted him because of all of that selfless giving, wherefore, this is the reason upon which you exalted him in Philippians 2, Father. Help us to lay down any idols we have. But more importantly, more importantly, that we just see Jesus as he is. And that we love Jesus as he is. And that we, we not be ashamed of Messiah crucified, of the message of the cross. That we become bold. That we become fixed and set. And that would truly lift you up in the manner that you said you wanted to be lifted up by the cross, not by the resurrection. You said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw. And let us see the true spirit and heart of, of your view of these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's see. Let's stand together. <clears throat> and... Everybody on this side, come over to this side. And everybody on this side, come over there. And everybody get.